thank you very much. Um, so for today, um, thank you again for coming to our presentation. We are really looking forward to sharing our work with you all. Um, so just want to go ahead and just let everybody know that we're going to get started here in just a second. So thank you all. Everyone ready? All right. So hello, hello everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share our work with you all today. My name is Warren Lewis and I'm the project manager for this project team. My other team members with me today are Sam McKinney, Kyle Sprang, and Marshall Smith. Throughout the semester, we've been partnered with the University of Arkansas Transit and Parking Department, which I'd like to give thanks to Gary Smith, Director of Transit and Parking, and Andy Gilbride, the project program manager for their assistance throughout the year. Today, we'll be discussing our analysis of the Transit and Parking Department's parking control segment. Parking control employs parking control officers or PCOs who are in charge of patrolling the university grounds and parking lots in order to identify and cite any vehicles in violation of the department's parking regulations. So to start off the presentation today, I'd like to invite Gary Smith, uh, director of the department to introduce us to himself as well as transit and parking. Hello, my name is Gary Smith. I'm the director of transit and parking at the University of Arkansas. I've been with the university for 42 years and in the transit and parking department for 36 years. The transit and parking department is tasked with providing safe, convenient and reliable transit and parking services to the campus community. We operate Razorback Transit, a federally, public, a federally funded public mass transit system, which provides a network of bus routes for students, faculty, staff, visitors, and the residents of Fayetteville. It also has a paratransit service for those who need it. We also operate the Safe Ride program, which is available late at night for students who find themselves in an uncomfortable situation or just need to get home. The parking portion of the department is responsible for the construction and maintenance and operation of almost 1,500 parking spaces on campus. This includes four garages and over 100 parking lots. Campus parking operates as an auxiliary, which means it's completely self-supporting. The operation of campus parking includes issuing parking permits, patrolling parking areas, enforcing parking regulations, managing billing for citations, and facilitating the appeals process. We also coordinate for par parking for over 400 special events a year. For this project, the focus is on the parking patrol service. Sam will provide more details, starting with the campus parking structure at the University of Arkansas. Thanks, Gary. So the parking system is divided into six zones, as you can see from the figure on the left. Within these six zones, there are 115 parking lots and roughly 14,600 parking spots. As you can also see from the figure, there's a variety of colors on the map. These colors represent the type of permit that are allowed to park in that parking lot. So for example, green is student, yellow is faculty and staff, blue is reserved, and red is resident reserved. As you can also see from the zoomed in picture of zone five on the right, it holds one of four parking garages that are on the University Harmon Avenue parking garage. We also recognize that some parking lots allow multiple types of permits to park in one parking lot, However, that does not change the way that a parking control officer patrols that lot. So now I'll move on to talk about the parking patrol system. In a regular year, there are 15 full-time PCOs or parking control officers. These PCOs either work the morning shift or evening shift. The morning shift is from 6.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. and the evening shift is from 2.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Let's take a look at the functional flow diagram that was created from shadowing a PCO. So starting at the zone level, a PCO is assigned a set of zones to patrol for a day in two hour intervals. After reaching that zone, so moving on to the parking lot level, a PCO will patrol those parking lots in a zone in whichever order they want to due to no patrol routes within a zone. However, the PCO is looking for 48 different types of violations while patrolling these lots, such as parking in front of a fire hydrant on a curb, but most importantly, making sure that the permit sticker on the front windshield matches the parking lot color as previously described. If a car is in violation, so moving down to the citation level, the PCO will determine what type of violation, check for previous offenses, take a picture of the violation, and put it on the front windshield of the car and will be represented in the student, faculty, or staff account. Now that we understand how the parking system and parking patrol system both work as a whole, I'll now go into detail about the problems with the current system. 
So in the beginning of the spring semester, the group created a fishbone diagram to help distinguish what problems we are currently facing in the system. As you can see from the graphic, there are six different areas that affect the problem of missed parking violations. However, many of these problems are either uncontrollable factors, such as causes that fall under environmental or material categories, or others that are just out of project scope, such as human error or departmental limitation categories. The area of the fishbone diagram in which we are focused on is in the upper left corner of the fishbone, the parking control process. So inside the parking control process, we found three potential areas that the process is lacking. First, the routes the PTOs take can easily be predicted by students or faculty if the same pattern is used on a cyclical basis. Next, the interlot routes are inefficient leading to longer travel times between parking lots, which means less cars evaluated and potentially more parking violations missed. And finally, a parking lot is simply just not staffed with a PTO due to either shift change, responding to a complaint, or they just don't reach that lot in the two hour patrol interval. So those three areas are the problems that we focused on to help tackle the main issue of missed parking violations. So now I'll talk more about a key assumption that we made regarding the parking control sector. The main area of concern is that PTOs are missing parking violations as previously described. As you can see from the figure, it depicts the total amount of cars that are parked at the University of Arkansas. Within the system, there are smaller subset of car, subsets of cars that are evaluated by PTOs, cars that are parked illegally, and even a smaller section that are issued citations. We recognize that there are two types of errors that PTOs can make, which symbolize an incorrect citation on a legally parked car or just an undetected violation. However, after talking to the department and shadowing a PCO, we feel comfortable assuming that these will not influence analysis. Therefore, updating our graphic to show that when a PCO officer has evaluated an illegally parked car, a citation will be issued. So with that, I'd like to now hand it off to Kyle in which he will introduce our data. That's right, thanks Sam. So the department gave us their citation data at the beginning of the year. It spans from March, 2019 to February, 2020. These are the months leading to the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, and we were able to sort it to just relevant data, meaning just uh, data with, that fall with day-to-day uh, -day operations. This consists of taking out citations from the weekends, athletic events, and citations that don't fall within normal hours. Uh, the data was then broken up into the lots that they were cited in uh, and to see how the system is currently performing. So the map here is a visual depiction that Sam created in Tableau. It's called a citation density map. It contains the 25 largest uh, lots in terms of citations recorded, otherwise known as hotspots, which uses the bubbles to depict the relative number of citations to one another and is color coordinated to represent the type of permit in that lot. These 25 lots contain nearly 80% of the total amount of citations issued in that March to March 2019 to February 2020 data. It is approximately about 34,000 citations. Following the Pareto principle, we felt that the visual depiction is best represented only by these 25 lots. Uh, to further describe the uh, citation density map, uh, the four largest counts of citations uh, occurred in the University of Arkansas parking garages seen in the gray which when discussed with the department seemed highly accurate. Similarly, the uh, 25 lots tend to come in clusters as far as the type of lot. Examples can be seen in zone one, which contains a noticeable amount of resident reserved lots in the red. And other examples could be seen in zones four and five, which contain a number of reserved lots shown in the blue. By documenting these locations and patterns, we're able to locate areas of high capture rate and see how PCO's location preference may change based on the area of campus they're in. Moving forward with the system's performance, we were able to use the same set of data, but however, we sorted it from just the lots that they were cited in into their appropriate zones. We then averaged the number of citations they were able to cite in a day based on the hour that they were cited in to see how the system was performing. As you can see here, we are comparing zones four, five, and six, each of which have their own peak citation capture times. Simple assumptions such as size and lacking or lack of parking garages is most likely the cause of this. Furthermore, all of the zones were put through the same analysis, individually letting us know which hours of the day PCOs were able to cite the most citations. It's important to have these values 
on record, so we can use it for estimating the system's performance later down the road. There are also some consistencies in the data that we'd like to address. The first is, at the start of the shift, the 68-hour interval, there is a much smaller amount of data. The second is the first shift of the day collectively always records um, more citations than the second shift of the day. The last and most important consistency is there is a drop in the data at the 15-hour interval, which accounts for the shift change in the middle of the day. We believe that there are citations being lost here, and we'll address this later in the presentation. With that being said, it is clear that data have provided a large role in understanding the current system and will help us in the future when trying to increase citation capture rate. Now let's look at how we we're able to replicate PCOs moving through the system. So in order for us to be able to measure PCO travel time within a system, we needed to know the, the distances between lots. UATP does not make routes for the PCO, nor do they have any data on hand revolving around it. So we decided the best way to model this was to um, put, the uh, put the lot locations in a virtual software and then route every possible path between them uh, using, in our case, we use Google Earth. In Google Earth, we drop the pens roughly at the center of each lot. Although PCOs might not start evaluating cars at the center of the lot, they might start sooner as soon as they entered. We decided to put it at the center of the lot for consistency sake. From here, we wanted to map routes from lot to lot to make a distance matrix for each of the zones. Uh, since UATP uh, travels from lot to lot by walking and driving, we created these routes two different ways. However, it's important to note when estimating uh, moving forward, we use the walking routes uh, instead of the driving routes, and we'll explain the usefulness of the driving routes later on. Anyways, so the, uh, the walking routes, we used all streets, sidewalks, and paths in order to calculate the distance from lot to lot. From, for the driving one, we obviously could only use roads to calculate distance from lot to lot. And this took a lot of effort due to the fact that there are one-way roads, unupdated roads on Google Earth, and closed roads that all had to be accounted for. Anyway, so that's how we were able to calculate the distance. Now I'll go on to how we were able to replicate the current system using those distances. So as mentioned before by Sam, PCOs, uh, which the route that they take is purely based off their own intuition. Therefore, we cannot directly measure PCOs travel efficiency. However, what we were able to do was create a Monte Carlo simulation to estimate the expected distance traveled by PCOs. We created a program in Microsoft Excel that could generate random routes for each patrol zone, and then we were able to simulate this 1 million times. After recording the distances from these 1 million simulations for each route, we put it into Arena's input analyzer and used the chi-squared goodness of fit test to see the expected patrol distance for each of the zones and make sure it was normally distributed like it is seen here. Instead of taking the, the mean of the normal distribution, however, we assume PCOs already have a level of travel efficiency, meaning they're most likely not going to always go from farthest away lots, which the program can do. So we thought that the best way to represent the PCOs travel efficiency is by taking the 25th percentile. Uh, results can be seen in the table below there. Results were expected as zone one contains the shortest travel distance. Zone one also contains the smallest footprint and the lowest number of lots. Inversely, zone six contains the largest number of lots and has the largest footprint. And we see the travel distance is much larger than all the other zones. Now I'll hand it off to Warren Wool, where he will uh, show you guys how we were able to minimize travel time and compare it to current operations. Thank you, Kyle. So to evaluate the minimum time that a PCO could spend between lots, we applied an adaptation of the classic traveling salesman problem to determine the path through each zone that would result in the minimum travel time. So to determine the shortest path, we used our recorded distances from Google Earth and performed what's called a nearest neighbor heuristic. Um, in this heuristic, it develops a path to each, to each lot with, within each zone by ordering the lots so that the closest available parking lot to the current PCO position is selected next in line. So an example can, of a nearest neighbor shortest path can be seen here on the left for zone one. In this route, the PCO starts at lot one, which is located in the southwest corner, and then moves up and clockwise through the zone until completing its route in lot 26. 
So we recorded the total distances from each of these routes and then used and then used them to calculate the time spent by dividing by an average walking speed of about three and a half miles per hour. So when compared to the 25th percentile seen from the previous slide, we can see how much PCO travel time can improve by in the figure here on the right. Depending on patrol zone, the PCO travel time could decrease as much as 63 to 72%. We see a large difference between our current estimates and our shortest paths for zone two and six, which correspond to the two zones with the largest number of lots and some of the larger footprints. This potential time saved is a big deal because as we mentioned before, if a PCO is traveling in between lots, they're not evaluating vehicles and thus not issuing citations. So when moving into our design solution design phase, we wanna make sure to take advantage of this to help increase the department's um, overall citation rates. So now I'm gonna shift gears and walk us through that solution design process I just mentioned. So in our solution design phase, we decided to take a systems decision approach to compare alternative routing policies so as can be seen here in our functional value hierarchy, our project finalized on three functions that were used to determine the success of our policies. First was that a policy must increase the department's violation capture rate. Second, the policy must have some sort of travel efficiency in order to minimize time spent between lots. And then finally, the routes generated from this policy need to contain an element of randomness to ensure that staff, students, faculty, or visitors do not become familiar with these routes and take advantage of the system. So through conversations with Gary, uh, Gary Smith and Andy Gilbride, we confirmed the level of importance um, for each of these functions. The first function being increasing citations, second travel efficiency, and third being randomness. Moving forward, we want to create an additive value model to compare our solutions. We assign swing weights to each of these objectives in the order of 50% for maximizing citation capture rate, 35 for minimizing officer travel time, and 15% for minimizing duplicate routes. So we use this additive value model to evaluate which of our alternative route, routing policies would thus be recommended to uh, the transit and parking department, which now I'll hand it over to Marshall to introduce us to. Thanks, Warren. The first policy that we considered was one we called a random start direction policy, which we abbreviated to RSD. The goal of this policy was to create a policy that focused on minimizing the travel time of the officers. We started by using the optimal routes that we found earlier for each zone. We then created a tool using Microsoft Excel and VBA macros that would pick a starting point uh, for the route and then decide if it would iterate through that list going up or down. This allows the parking control officers to always be able to travel according to the shortest path while also so retaining elements of unpredictability. This unpredictability would come from the fact that those who are parking would not know where the officers would be starting their routes or if they'll be traveling the shortest path going clockwise or counterclockwise. The picture helps illustrate this idea. The star represents the starting point for the route and the arrows describe how the officer would move between lots, the gray boxes. For the first day, the PCO would start at the bottom lot and then travel between the lots in a counterclockwise manner along the shortest path. On the second day, the PCO would move through the zone going clockwise along the shortest path and then start at the top rightmost lot. For each time a parking control officer would travel through a zone, a new route would be generated, meaning there would be up to eight different routes each day. We commonly referred to our second policy as a random with upper bound policy, abbreviating it to UB. Our goal with this policy was to generate as many reasonable routes as possible so that it would be difficult to anticipate what routes the parking control officers would travel. We created a tool using Microsoft Excel and VBA macros that would generate routes with travel times that fell within the 10th percentile of possible travel times. The tool would randomly select one of the lots to be the starting point and then would select the next destinations from the list of remaining lots. This continues until all the lots had been selected. Then the travel time of the route would be estimated in the same way we did previously. And if the route fell within the 10th percentile of travel time distribution we found earlier, then the route would be used. If the route didn't fall in that 10th percentile, then the process would start again. The picture on the slide helps visualize how the routes from this policy might look. With the star as the starting point of, for the routes, the arrow span across the zone showing that the officers would 
uh, could move more sporadically from lot to lot, allowing their movements to be very hard to predict. We used three different measures to determine how well our policies performed according to the three functions that were most important to our client. We evaluated how many different routes each policy could generate to measure how hard it would be to anticipate the uh, parking control officer's movements. For the random start direction policy, we got the number of different routes possible by multiplying the number of lots in a zone by two, since there are two routes that start with each lot. For the random with upper bound, we knew that there were n factorial possible routes for each zone, where n is the number of lots uh, in each zone. Since the policy only uses the 10th percentile of routes, we multiplied it the n factorial by 0.1 to get the number of possible routes for the random with upper bound policy. In the table on the left, we see that the values for each policy for, by each zone. We see that the random with upper bound policy has, for practical purposes, infinitely more possible routes that it can generate than the random start direction policy. Next, we sought to determine how well our policies maximize the number of citations captured by our parking control officers. To do this, we used a proxy measure due to a lack of data available on when and where violations occur when they're not being detected by parking control officers. The proxy measure that we used was the number of parking spaces a parking control officer was able to control within a two hour period. The use of this proxy was justified with the reasoning that the more spaces an officer is able to patrol, the more violations they'll be able to detect. To capture this measure, we generated 32 routes using each policy for each zone. We then evaluated how many spaces an officer was able to patrol by estimating how long it would take for an officer to travel between lots uh, following the route, and then how long it would take an officer to go through each lot based off the number of spaces in each lot. For this measure, we made two assumptions that were maintained for each policy. Those being that we assumed a parking control officer walking speed of 3.5 miles an hour, which we've used previously, and that a parking control officer would be delayed in a lot by four seconds per space, which we confirmed with our client. Our results are in the, uh, for this measure are in the top right graph. Represented in orange, we see that the random start direction policy consistently outperformed the random with upper bound policy represented in blue by allowing the officers to be able to patrol 8.8% more parking spaces. The last measure that our policies were evaluated by, by was how long an op it took an officer to travel between each lot and each zone. We started by estimating the average distances the routes for each policy. For the random start direction, the distance traveled by the officer for each zone is the distance of the shortest path for each zone. These distances were then divided by the assumed walking speed of officers, which was 3.5 miles per hour, to get our value measure. For the random with upper bound policy, we took the simulated travel times defined our 10th percentile bound and took their average for each zone. The values that were found for both policies for each zone are displayed in the chart on the bottom right of the slide. Again, we see that the random start direction policy in orange outperforms the random with upper bound, which is in blue. We see that the random start direction policy provides routes with 42 to 64 percent shorter travel times than the random with upper bound policy. Lastly, having calculated these values uh, for each measure for each policy, we then could plug those values into our additive value model. As you can see on top, our ideal solution is displayed to have 100% of the possible value. Our random start direction policy was able to capture over 80% of the possible value of the ideal solution which is the middle bar. The random with upper bound policy was only able to capture a little over than 40% of the value of the ideal solution. We can see that the random start direction policy's superiority comes from its ability to evaluate more parking spaces and provide faster travel times for the PCOs. Therefore, 
we decided to use the random start direction policy in our tool to help generate routes for the, ran uh, for the University of Arkansas's Transit and Parking Department, which Warren will now help describe. Thank you, Marshall. To improve the implementation of our recommended random start and direction routing policy, we wanted to provide our client with a way to automate the route generation process. We settled on creating an Excel-based tool that allows any UATP employee to easily and consistently create RSD-based patrol routes. I'll now take, us some, take some time to walk us through all the features included in our tool. When open, the user is brought to our introduction form seen here, which displays the tool's two main features. First, route generation, and the second, the ability to update the tool. The route generation feature is the tool's main function and is where the user will go in order to create RSD patrol routes. The update lot and zone information function allows UATP to add or remove lots permanently to the tool as the changes in the campus parking system occur. So if the user selects route generation, they are brought to this new user form. This form allows for several added functions. First, the user can select which zones to and not to create patrol routes for by navigating the tab strip labeled by zone and then selecting to create a route or not. If create a route is selected for a zone, the user is presented with two more options. First, the user can select if the route will be conducted by either walking or driving with a patrol vehicle. Gary Smith and Andy Gilbride expressed their interest in the ability to differentiate between these modes of transportation because currently the university uh, parking control officers are walking However, they're soon moving over to a license plate recognition system beginning with the fall of 2021 semester, which will be conducted using patrol vehicles. Vehicle routes differ from walking routes, as Kyle had mentioned before, because they can only drive along the streets and not sidewalks, and they also must consider one-way roads. So to take this into account, we develop shortest paths and implement them into our tool. Get the next available option for the, is the ability to select, lots, remo select to remove lots from the generated routes. So Gary and Andy again expressed their, their need to remove these lots from the path if needed. So if the remove lot option is selected, a list box containing the parking lots within a zone initializes to be seen on the bottom of the form, and the user can select which lots to be removed by selecting the lot name. Once, options are all, once all the options are selected for each zone, the user selects generate routes to create an output like is seen here on the right. For the update lot and zone information feature, the user is brought to a separate form seen here. And this form is broken down either by adding or removing a lot from the tool. To remove a lot, the user first specifies by selecting the associated option button and then proceeds to select a zone from the drop down menu. From there, another list box, like seen before, will populate and the user can select which lot to be removed. For the add a lot feature, the tool needs a lot more input. The user starts by selecting a zone from the drop down menu like before and then inputting the new lot's name. The tool then populates two more subsections. Looking at the section at the bottom left, we can see that the user must select the two closest lots to the new lot's location. This is important because the tool will add the new lot to the shortest path in between the two selected lots. The user must do this twice, once for walking and once for vehicle routes, because as was mentioned before, walking and vehicle routes are different. Along with all these described features, the tool also includes error checking, return buttons, and help buttons along the way to increase the user's experience. Once this tool is completed, we showed the abilities to Gary and Andy, who were pleased with the functionality, and after presenting the tool, we handed it over to UATP for use. So this concludes the work revolving um, our improved routing process, which now I'd like to hand it over to Sam to describe the scheduling aspect of the project and how we address the apartment's uh, shift change issue. Thanks, Warren. So once we created our routing deliverable, we wanted to make sure that we had addressed concerns revolving around PCO scheduling. Due to the consistent drop in the data revolving around the 2.30 p.m. shift change, we believe that UATP is missing up to more than $80,000 of revenue. We estimated that this by taking one hour incremental averages between the 14 and 16 hour interval, and the graphic reflects the changes during the 15 hour interval. We believe if they were able to cover this interval with overlapping shifts, that they would be able to cite more citations. We created three solutions to guide the decision-making process. The first is moving the night shift back an hour so the PCOs would start earlier and get off earlier. The second is to extend the night shift by an hour. And finally, the third is to create an entirely new midday shift with part-time PCOs. With that being said, we have displayed all the costs concerned with each alternative here. And because alternatives two and three have much higher costs, we ran the alternatives through a benefit cost analysis, which compares the lowest cost alternatives to higher cost alternatives to see if the added cost is truthfully worth it. The examples of costs for each alternatives are radios, printers, phones that PCOs use, as well as added wages for full-time and part-time PCOs. 
As a result, alternative two did not outweigh alternative one. However, alternative three had the potential to be better than alternative one. Therefore, we created a break-even analysis to determine what level of added effectiveness PCOs would need in order for alternative three to outweigh alternative one. Because we do not have the information to estimate the total population of parking violations, we estimated through the break-even analysis that new PCOs would have to capture more than 21% of the capture rate in the previous year during the work hours for alternative three to outweigh alternative one. So moving forward with the implementation of these shift changes policies, it's important to note that these, are, these alternatives are our estimates and it's up to the department to decide on these changes. So with that, I would like to hand it back to Gary Smith who would like to talk more about our time with us before I conclude the presentation. Thank you. This has been the third time we've been involved with the industrial engineering capstone class and this team has been the best yet. They were professional and very productive. They provided worthwhile information, including the Excel-based patrol path planning tool. Annie and I have enjoyed working with them and we're excited to implement their, rec their recommendations to improve campus parking patrol. Thank you all. Thanks, Gary. So to end today's presentation, I would like to leave on a couple of key takeaways. First, we worked with the University of Arkansas Transit and Parking Department in order to provide improved policies to increase the department's violation capture rates. We compared two different policies, one that utilized a random starting point and direction along the optimal path called RSD, and one that created a random route that fell within the 10th percentile of travel distance called UB. UB was able to outperform based on randomness measure. However, RSD yielded shorter travel times and better patrol coverage, thus was selected for implementation. Finally, we found that the department was losing over $80,000 in citation-based revenue during the 2.30 p.m. shift change. We created several alternative solutions and found the key deciding factors that could influence UATP's decision by performing a break-even analysis. So with that being said, that concludes our presentation. Thank you all again for your attendance and thanks again to Gary, Andy, and the rest of, rest of Transit and Parking for supporting our capstone experience. I would now like to open up the floor for any questions you guys all may have, as well as the chat box as well, if you feel more comfortable asking questions in there as well. So thank you again.